A lot of Christians say that I only go after the easy targets, that I should take on some of the real arguments for God. The solid arguments put together by the greatest theistic philosophers of all time. One name they like to kick around is Thomas Aquinas, who lived in the 13th century, and for some reason they think that he had these great arguments for the existence of God. This guy is considered one of the greatest theistic thinkers of all time. I, on the other hand, am an overweight high school dropout who still adds with his fingers. Seven, eight, nine, yeah. And I am smarter than Thomas Aquinas. By an order of magnitude. And that's not just boasting or bluster. I can prove it. This man was an imbecile. See, our friend Tommy Boy came up with five proofs that God exists. Five handy-dandy little logical sequences that show definitively that there is a God. And if you examine them, they're actually all quite silly. Or, to put it more eloquently, they're fucking retarded. Aquinas' first argument, motion. One, objects are in motion. Two, if something is in motion, then it must be caused to be in motion by something outside of itself. Three, there can be no infinite chain of movers, movies. Four, so there is a first unmoved mover. Five, therefore God exists. His first statement, objects are in motion, is pretty sound, unless you throw your hat in with a solipsist. Of course, if you are a solipsist, then you think there is only one solipsist, and that's you. But the solipsists aren't right, so that's a pretty solid starting point anyway. His second premise, that if something is in motion, it must have been caused to be in motion by something else, is not really all that egregious. I suppose you could have a little bit of a semantics argument with some of the terms there, but nothing horrendously wrong jumps out at me about that statement. His third premise, that the chain of movers and movies cannot be infinite, is just not justifiable. How the fuck does he know? We don't understand infinity. The human mind can't understand that concept. We don't understand that concept today, yet Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century somehow was able to grasp infinity and declare what can and cannot be infinite. His fourth statement that there is therefore an unmoved mover is just fucking ridiculous. First of all, it contradicts his second premise that unless an object is acted upon by another object, it cannot be in motion. It's also based on the assumption that there can be no infinite chain of movers and movies, which we already established is pretty fucking absurd, especially for some moron living in the 13th century with no concept of modern science. So this argument is crumbling, it's falling apart, it's collapsing under the weight of its own arbitrary rules. And then there's his conclusion, therefore God exists. This is, I mean, let's say we accept everything he said before. This is still not a valid conclusion. Because why is the unmoved mover necessarily God? Why can't it be a blueberry muffin? Why can't we say, yeah, there was an unmoved mover, it was a blueberry muffin, and from it came all other things? Sounds a little bit more plausible than God to me, because hey, I've seen a fucking blueberry muffin. Those motherfuckers are tasty. I ain't never seen God. I don't know what he tastes like. Probably like sour milk. Aquinas' second argument, causality. One, some events cause other events. That argument is exactly the same as your motion argument. I'm not refuting the same argument twice. Moving on. Aquinas' third argument, contingency. One, contingent things exist. Yes, like the Earth is reliant upon the Sun to sustain life on Earth. In other words, our existence is contingent upon the Sun's existence. Two, each contingent thing has a time at which it fails to exist. Contingent things are not omnipresent. Well, let's think about it like this. If you are editing a video on your computer, which is obviously something we do a lot of around here, then you need the video files and you need the editing software. Both of these things have to be there in order for you to edit a video. You can't edit a video if you have no video. You can't edit a video if you have no video editor. Both of those things are contingent upon one another, and the final product, the edited video, is contingent upon you having both of those things. 
But even if both of those things are gone, if you have the hard drive capable of sustaining either of them, then they could both conceivably come back into existence. You can get new video because it can be sustained by your hard drive. You can get a new editing software because it too can be sustained by your hard drive. So if there is a higher contingency, then these lower contingencies can always flicker in and out of existence. It doesn't matter if one goes away for a little while, it can come back because the conditions under which it could exist are always going to be there. Three, so if everything were contingent, there would be a time at which nothing exists. Call this an empty time. Not accurate, because as we already talked about, all you need is the higher contingency that supports everything else. In this case, existence itself. As long as there is a universe, you can always have stuff in that universe. The universe is a place where you can put stuff, and stuff makes everything. Everything is stuff. Four, that empty time would have been in the past. Well, assuming linear time, and assuming that all of your premises up till now are correct, sure. But how do you know? We don't know of any such time. We do know of a time, and time might not be the right word here, but there was a time at the beginning of the universe when all matter was compressed into something roughly the size of a particle. This was prior to the Big Bang, although prior might not be the right word since time didn't exist until the Big Bang happened. Although happened might not be the right word. It's all very fucking confusing. The point is, there's no grounds for making this statement. Five, if the world were empty at one time, it would be empty forever, a conservation principle. Maybe, but you don't really know that. And you've yet to sufficiently convince me that the universe was ever empty. Six, so if everything were contingent, nothing would exist now. Well, that's an awful big leap. In your first premise, you say everything could be contingent. Now you're saying everything is contingent. So that's an awful big leap, first of all. But, you know, it only takes one thing that isn't contingent upon anything else. Let's say that even in the void, even in the desolation, blueberry muffins could come into existence. And then everything that is contingent upon blueberry muffins could come into existence. And then everything that is contingent upon the contingent things of blueberry muffins could come into existence. And so on and so forth until everything is here. All thanks to blueberry muffins. Aren't they fucking special? Isn't that just the best blueberry laden breakfast treat you've ever fucking seen? Creating all things? Isn't it fucking wonderful? Seven. But clearly the world is not empty. Premise one. Sure. Eight. So there exists a being who is not contingent. Well, why does it have to be a being? We've already discussed my blueberry muffin hypothesis, but even discarding both of ours, doesn't a single particle seem more likely than an entirely formed sentient consciousness capable of acts of spontaneous creation? I'm just saying, seems a little bit more likely. Single particle, very simple thing. Huge, complex intelligence, very complicated thing, and in dire need of some explaining itself. How did this being come to be? Nine, hence God exists. You failed to demonstrate why existence itself can't be the ultimate contingency. You failed to demonstrate that there would necessarily need to be something that isn't contingent upon anything else. You failed to demonstrate that that thing, if it existed, would need to be a being, and you never demonstrated that if that thing needed to be a being, it would be the Christian God. So, once again, Thomas Aquinas, you fucking suck. Aquinas's fourth argument, properties that come in degrees. Number one, objects have properties to greater or lesser extents. Well, sure, yeah. As fat as I am, there are people much, much fatter than me. People who are a foot shorter than me who weigh four times as much. Yeah, okay, sure. I'm with you so far. What's next? Two, if an object has a property to a lesser extent, then there exists some other object that has the property to the maximum possible degree. What? What the f What the fuck are you talking about, Thomas Aquinas? Were you high? So wait, this, this being that you're talking about, he's the, the skinniest being and the fattest being. He's the, 
He's the sexiest being and the least sexy being. He's the straightest being and he's the gayest being. He has every property to the max. Is that what you're saying? Because that's fucking retarded. Three, so there is an entity that has all properties to the maximum possible degree. Four, hence God exists. You know, I don't even believe that Thomas Aquinas is this stupid. So let's find a better summation of these rules, because I don't think this is accurate. Aquinas' fourth argument, second version, gradation of being. One, there is a gradation to be found in things. Some are better or worse than others. Two, predications of degree require references to the uttermost case. Three, the maximum in any genus is the cause of all in that genus. Four, therefore there must also be something which is to all beings the cause of their being, goodness, and all other perfection. And this we call God. Oh, so Thomas Aquinas isn't saying that there's a being that possesses every trait to the maximum, only every positive trait to the maximum. So actually, Aquinas isn't as dumb as the first summation of this argument led me to believe. He's even dumber. Wow, Christians, really? This is your great champion? I'm not impressed. I really am not. I honestly expected something better than this. I, I, I mean, I was kind of like, you know, maybe I'll leave this guy for someone a little smarter than me. I'll let, like, Dawkins go after him, or at least Thunderfoot or something. I'm not going to be able, I don't have the science chops. I'm like a, a D-minus science student, and I suck at math, and I'm not that well learned when you get right down to it. But this is fucking ridiculous. This is easy. This is like something a kindergartner would come up with. And that's why there's a god! Shut up! Go do your homework. Quit being stupid. Aquinas' fifth argument from design. One, among objects that act for an end, some have minds, whereas others do not. Very true. Objects like me have minds, and objects like Sarah Palin do not. Two, an object that acts for an end, but does not in itself have a mind, must have been created by a being that does have a mind. Yeah, or it could be acting in accordance to natural law. You know, a star doesn't shine because a man in the sky said, let the stars shine and shimmer. It shines because billions of years ago, nebulas collapsed and hydrogen particles clumped together in larger and larger clumps and till the gravity was so immense that their cores ignited. And you know what, I'm not a fucking scientist, but the point is that this isn't like some magic man said, let there be stars. There are some hard fucking science behind this shit and we know what happened. We're not living in the 13th century anymore like Thomas Dumbass Aquinas. We're living in the 21st century. We know how this shit works, or at least we should. Three, so there exists a being with a mind who designed all mindless objects that act for an end. <sighs> it's always a being with you, Thomas Aquinas. You're like one of those guys who when he loses his keys, he claims someone stole them. Yeah, they're, my keys are gone. It's a mystery. I think there was a being who came in here and removed my keys. Bullshit, there wasn't no being. You dropped them behind the fucking dresser. Quit being a dumbass. Four, hence God exists. Nope, sorry, once again, you failed to show that. I really don't know why Christians make such a big deal out of this guy. Frankly, most modern Christians, most modern theistic philosophers could wipe the floor with this fucking guy. Okay, his stuff might have sounded kind of impressive when only a scant few people had access to books or knew how to read, or had these materials available to them in the 13th century, that might have sounded real solid. But by today's standards, this shit is half past retarded. In fact, it's half shy of retarded. What is... I don't understand. I, I'm assuming that Christians must just never read this shit. They're probably just told, yeah, there was this guy in the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas, he figured it all out, don't look into it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's what's happening here, because this shit is stupid. Just dumb. Even if you are a believer, you've got to admit that these arguments are just fucking lousy.
Maybe I'll try C.S. Lewis next time. At least he lived more recently than this choker. I'm assuming that his arguments have to be a little bit better. <sighs> it's all